This is Leslie Villarreal and I'm in my studio talking to you again about uh, metalsmithing tools. This is Intro to Metalsmithing Tools, Basic Information, Part 2. So I'm going to talk to you today about things we didn't talk about in the first video, which we talked about. Uh, the first one were um, setting up your soldering station using different torches, um, uh, how to solder a piece of metal and uh, how to pickle it, how to put it in your rotary tumbler, and we talked about some finishing tools as well. So today we're just going to talk about hand tools for the most part. So let's get right into it. Um, let's first talk about hammers. So I think the first kind of uh, hammers that you're going to want to invest in will be ones for moving metal, for hammering metal. Um, not so much for working with tools because the first thing that you probably are going to want to do is take a piece of metal and form it a little bit. So um, you can even just start out with a basic ball peen hammer. A ball peen hammer has a, a round end for texturing and a flat smooth end for planishing. Um, you can do anything you want with a ball peen. It's a heavy uh, duty hammer and this is a tiny one but they do come in all shapes and sizes. Um, it's important though if you're going to be working on metal whatever surface of hammer you're using should be shiny and smooth unless you don't want your metal to be shiny and smooth because if I have a scratched up surface on my hammer and I'm hitting my metal with it my metal is going to get the impression of whatever I put here it's going to texture that onto the metal so you want to use a hammer that is appropriate for what you want to achieve on your metal. If you want texture on your metal, then use a hammer with a rougher surface or you can hammer on an, on an anvil that is um, um, textured in some way or a stake speed up if you want that sort of look. If you want a nice smooth um, texture on your metal, you may want to just start out with a planishing hammer. And I would say that this is probably my favorite hammer, my number one hammer. And this is a frets hammer. Fretz makes each of their hammers in different weights and different sizes. This is a number one Fretz planishing hammer. I think it has a number one on it right there. You can probably see that. And it has a round end and it has a flat side. And the ends are highly polished because I want, when I hit my silver, I want my, or my brass or whatever I'm hitting with this hammer, I want it to forge and shape my metal. So um, the definition of planishing is forging and shaping and work hardening. Um, to use a planishing hammer, you want to make light, smooth strokes that are kind of overlapping. And that's how you use a planishing hammer. So uh, let me zoom in here for you. So let's say I just cut this piece of metal out with metal shears or a saw or whatever, and I want to make it into you know, um, a piece of jewelry or pendant or something that might be mounted onto something else. I'm going to want to planish it. It's a little lumpy. So I'm going to want to take my planishing hammer on the flat side and I'm going to want to hit it against a smooth surface with overlapping strokes to planish it out. And a planishing hammer We'll also take out um, marks from other hammers, so it'll smooth it out. So if you started out with a different hammer and you got some, maybe your ball peen and you hammered it and cut it and you want to smooth it out, then you would go to a planishing hammer and that will give you a nice smooth surface uh, on your metal. Um, if I had started out with uh, the wrong tool for this job, which a lot of people use a chasing hammer, um, I would have gotten probably a lot of marks on my metal. So you look at the end of my chasing hammer. Now the problem with that is the chasing hammer is not meant for hitting metal. This head is very soft. The proper use of a chasing hammer is to hit a tool like this. It's not supposed to hit metal. So this is a cheap chasing hammer and if you're going to make a big investment in a chasing hammer you can, but to start off with since it's used to strike another tool, I don't really think that's the best place to spend your money. I have a frets chasing hammer, um, but I bought it when I didn't really know that I shouldn't be using a chasing hammer to hit my metal. A lot of uh, tutorials you'll see out there will tell you, you know, let's start with a chasing hammer to hit your metal. Not the best advice um, because it's just, it's just wrong. The face of the metal is too soft. So if I'm doing chasing and repose, with my chasing hammer hitting the end. So it's going to be like this. And then I'm moving and I'm moving 
and I'm moving and I'm moving. And that, or even just doing a setter punch dot, that's what this tool is for. What's cool about a chasing hammer is the ball peen side is great for texturing metal. So if I want a beautiful hammered look, see that, okay. So um, anyway, so use the right tool for the right piece of metal. Start out with a planishing hammer to smooth out your metal if that's what you, the desire you're going for. Um, now if I wanted to hammer on, let's say, it also, steel blocks, steel blocks um, will pick up hammer marks, so they won't stay perfect forever. Um, so it's going to also pick up texture marks, but a really good anvil will not pick up the marks of your hammer. Now, if you want to get texture onto your piece and you, you know, don't want a smooth piece, I have this old railroad um, tie that is a great anvil. Um, it also has a little point here that I use for some metal forming uh, and, the, and the surface will not be smooth so that when I hammer on this with any kind of a hammer it doesn't really matter I could use my ball peen it's going to pick up the, the rough texture from my anvil and it's going to be on my metal so just keep in mind that anytime you are hammering on a surface your metals here whatever is your metal is between your base plate and your hammer is what's going to end up on your metal. So if you want a smooth piece, you make sure you've got a nice polished face on your hammer so that you can get a nice polished finished piece on your metal. I'll talk to you about texture hammers since we kind of got into texturing your metal. These are hammers that have texture on them. But if you're trying to get um, a fun texture, this one has like dots and this one has swirls and this one has circles and this one has like a cheese grater look and this one has lines and this one has little stars now whatever i when i hit this that's what i'm going to get so i'll get like a repeated pattern on my metal these the hammers i think they come in sets of three i think you can buy them separately or with interchangeable heads i wide cover a wide surface in a short amount of time so i'll show you how this works There you go. So I got the pattern from this onto my, my metal. The next type of hammer that I'd like to introduce, and this is a dead blow hammer. This is great for flattening out. They're from Harbor Freight, and they come in one pound, two pound, and five pound. And those can be used for just flattening out pieces, like you know, if you've got a jump ring or something, you wanna hit it and just make it flat without marring it. You can use that when you need some weight. Um, the rawhide mallet and the plastic mallet are pretty much for truing up metal um, on, on a shank or let's say you make a ring and you've just soldered your ring and it's in this funky shape because you're trying to keep it flat where you're soldering and it's not quite a circle. So you're gonna take that ring and you're gonna put it on a ring mandrel. And let's say you do not want at this point to mar it up, you wanna keep that nice and smooth, you might consider using a rawhide mallet for that. You would hit it until it took on the shape of the mandrel and became completely round. You could also use a plastic hammer. If you need a little bit more weight or a heavier hammer, this one would be the one because it's heavier than the rawhide mallet. And you could get a little bit more forming done. So you could stretch it out a little bit faster if your metal's heavier and thicker. So uh, that is a plastic coated hammer. Also, you know, just to recap, you're not gonna get any texture on your metal when using these. So um, if you're gonna be doing any stamping, um, with big heavy stamps, beautiful old vintage stamps, and they're quite big and heavy. And then I've got some just little regular ones too. Um, and when I'm hitting metal, I need some force. So I'm going to use, this is a two pound, one pound hammer would, would probably be sufficient for you for stamping on your metal surfaces. So, um, so if I wanted to hammer on this piece of metal, you can see this okay. A brass mallet. And I can hit it once or I can kind of rock my stamp a little bit to make sure. On a heavier piece, sometimes you want to rock it. Let me just show you. This is just a simple uh, dot. And this is a swirl. I'm going to 
that was the rocking method I showed, wanted to show you. So you can probably see that even though I moved my uh, stamp around a little bit, it made a nice impression because I kind of rocked it a bit. Just Sometimes if you have a big stamp and you just hit it with one blow, it won't give you a really good impression. But if you kind of rock it the way I just did, that's a little t tip for you. You'll get a nicer impression. And with some of these great big stamps, you really have to rock it. So I hit it quite a few times there. If I just hit it one time hard, it wouldn't. I would have got half of the stamp. But there, I got the number three in pretty good. So that's what the brass mallet is for. Um, they make them in different. Um, the one that looks like a claw hammer, but it's small and it's also heavy, and it's really good for that too. What you want on the brass hammer is a nice big face, um, and it's so soft because it's brass. It, it just grabs onto your stamp. You can see how marred up these are. But they're not ever, again, going to hit your metal. They're going to hit your tool. They're like a giant uh, chasing hammer. <laughs> so, um, let's see. Another great hammer to have is, um, if you're going to start doing metal forming, is um, one like this. This is a teardrop mallet that I got from Harbor Freight. It's really cheap. But it is great for um, not marking your metal. And, and if you're doing like a dome or a cup and you want to get inside and hit that, that type of, of uh, shape, this is great for that too. Or maybe you're doing some anti-clastic and synclastic forming, um, which is a little bit more advanced and it's not usually something that people start out with. You, would, you could use that kind of a hammer. Or um, Fretz makes this, it's a number 107. And this hammer has different heads. It has 11 interchangeable heads. And this is used with a, an anti-clastic or sinusoidal stake, which is kind of a curvy stake. Mm, I think I have one here. Hang on one second. And you would put your metal into the groove and you would actually strike it with this. And so you can see the shape of that on the end. That's going to help you hammer more on a straight edge without marring your metal. So the other rule with these is if you're hitting metal and you're shaping on a sinusoidal stake that's metal, you want to use uh, a plastic hammer. If you're using a wooden or a plastic stake, then you would use a metal hammer. Kind of the the, tool, the way it goes. When I first started in metal smithing, um, was a riveting hammer. I re rarely use it for rivets. I mostly use it for texturing because it has this great little uh, edge on the side. If you can see it, but it makes like this beautiful rain mark, uh, rain pattern. I can maybe show you in my rings. I use it all the time. It's great for texturing. Rings or your um, bezels or, or pendants. Another thing that you should have when you're learning to, when you're starting out, is a pillow. The pillow is meant to lay your steel block on top of, like this, and it absorbs the sound when you're hitting. Um, but I don't really use mine for that. What I do use it for is repoussé work. So in chasing and repoussé, you can uh, lay a sheet of metal and you can start forming it. I use it in place of a pitch bowl. And a pitch bowl is a bowl full of a substance that allows your, your metal to take form and shape on the back. Whereas if I hammer on a piece of steel, the back is going to be a, the, whatever shape is on the back of the steel. It's going to be flat. If I hammer here on something like this, on something like this, my metal bends, you see? And so if I wanted it to bend, if I wanted to, let's say, hammer out a heart shape or something, I could do that and I could get it to form into whatever shape I wanted to. And that's what I really use my pillow for. Okay, so let's see, another thing that you're going to need besides your bench block is um, a center punch. And your center punch, there's different types you can use. I showed you this one and how to hit it with your chasing tool. When you're, when you're going to use a piece of metal to um, drill a hole in it, the first thing you have to do is you have to put a punch in it or a divot. If you don't do that, what's going to happen is bit, your drill bit is going to move and slide and scratch up your metal and probably not make the hole where you want it to be. So you have to be very intentional when you're drilling 
and you would just take this and you'd make a divot just like that and it makes a tiny little divot there you see and that divot then would go underneath my my drill and i would drill a hole with that but he has these center punch um they also come you know, harbor freight has a pack like this and they come um like this one different size holes on the end um, one here is a 132nd i think it says there and this is a 332nd so we have different size and if you can see the ends they are different sizes on the ends. One makes a, a big circle, one makes a little one. And so if I wanted to stamp and use these for stamps, I can do that too. And you can see I get different uh, round circles um, that are not filled inside. So um, you can use them as decorative stamps as well. Another type of a punch is an, called an automatic punch. These are about $8, and um, I got mine on Amazon. And all you do, instead of having to hit it with a hammer, is you just take it and push. And you can just, you don't have to use a hammer in the other hand, and you will get a nice little divot there also. That's, this divot was made with the punch, this one right here. Okay, um, you're going to also need a pair of cutters to cut your metal. Now, cutting your metal, um, you're going to find out really fast that all the fancy French and German shears are so pretty, and they feel so good in your hand, but they don't last very long. Um, the blades get dull really quick, and I, I started burning them up, and, I, and they're not cheap, so I um, contacted Rio Grande, so they recommended these. These are made by La Forbes. They're old and yucky, and they're really um, well used. That is the name. If you go on Rio Grande's website and you go to their shears link, you'll see a picture of these and they're the only ones like these and they are really good shears. You're going to need pliers to do different things. I have this really nice set here of, one of them is not in here right now. These are um, Revere pliers and they come in a set of four and you get a half round you get looping pliers and you get um, chain nose pliers. Now all of those are really important to use when you're making things. If you're going to make jump rings, you really can't do it without looping pliers or anytime you need to make a circle and a little loop. Um, you can also get bigger ones if you want to get into these. Um, these would make up to 10 millimeter uh, jump rings. Um, so it's 10 and I don't know, this looks like maybe a 5 millimeter and a 3 millimeter would be my guess. You can see the ends are big. But anyway, that is what those are for, those pliers. Um, chain nose pliers I don't have here, but they are very, they're identical to these. These are flat nose pliers, except they're pointed on the end. And you will use those a lot in jewelry making. So chain nose pliers flat nose pliers, these are flat nose, and looping pliers, and half round pliers. These are round on, they're half round on the bottom. You see on the inside, it, it goes like this. So it has like a little, little hump there. Um, and then the other end is just flat. Now when you're making ring or bending metal, and you want to bend it into more of a, um, you're making a ring shank and you want to bend it, you can use these and it'll keep the, keep it round and keep the metal from collapsing on you. You can also get these really large. I use these for making uh, um, so, uh, bracelets, uh, making like links on bracelets or, or on pendants. If you want to make a thick chain or you know a, um, a bracelet, that's what these are for. So huge jump rings. And some sort of a ruler that has millimeters on it is really, really, really good. Because you'll find in jewelry you work more in millimeters and um, centimeters than you do in inches. So just any kind of steel ruler will work as long as it has centimeters, which are on the top there. And a ring mandrel is going to be important if you want to make a ring. <laughs> so um, there, you can use them for other things too, just making loops and that sort of thing. And I've showed you this already, but here it is again. A ring mandrel, and I would not recommend the ones that are stepped. They're nice, but if you get the ones that are stepped, they are just like this, except you know, so you see how the steps are. It's like you go from a size 10 to a size 
11, and they're all separated. Here they're just all kind of like on one cone and they're joined. So this is just called a straight ring mandrel. And if you get one like this, um, it's the kind you can hammer on and true up your um, ring shanks on. So a very important tool, um, make sure you get one. I don't really have much use for a ring mandrel holder because I can just prop it up on my bench here when I'm ready to use it. I can just prop it up against my pillow and I can true up my rings up like this. So I don't really care about having anything to hold it. Let me, oh yeah, let me show you this. This is something that you would use. This is called a ring holder and it is used for holding a ring. When you're working on a ring, you could put it in here and use this to clamp it and it will keep it steady while you mount the stones or drill or file or whatever you need to do on top of it. This is a handy tool and you should have one of these too. All right, now let's talk about your bench pin. So I have a bench pin here and mine is, um, mine has a, a steel block on top. You certainly don't need that kind of a, of a bench pin. Just a block of wood and a C-clamp will work. So what you want to do when you're using your bench pin is you want to make sure that your body, my desk is quite high. I actually have an old door mounted on top of some cabinets and it makes an excellent workbench. And you can see where I'm at now. And I have one of those um, earth light massage stools. They're just an, a pneumatic stool. You can actually see another one over there maybe. Yeah, right there. There's not another one. I have a few of them in my studio. So when I teach, my students can have them too. Um, but I like to sit on my... When you're sitting at a proper workbench, your, your, your bench will be high. It'll be about to here, or you can have it higher or lower. I like mine right about here. When you're sawing and when you're working, you don't want to be looking down like this. So you don't want your work to be down here and your head to be up here. It's much different than sitting at a computer desk. Um, you want to be kind of like eye-leveled with what you're doing because you can see, and it's really important to be able to see when you're doing, you know, cutting especially, cutting with a saw, because cutting with a saw is, um, it's, it, it's work. Um, especially when you first start out, you need to have your bench pin in the right position so that you can see that your saw blade's straight or whatever you're drilling. If I'm drilling something with my Fordham, I'll do it on my bench pin and I'll take my flex shaft and, then, and my, mine has a ton of little holes in it because I use it also for drilling, a drilling surface on. Okay, so try to fall in love with your jeweler saw. They come in many different shapes and sizes. <laughs> so I've tried a lot of jeweler saws. Um, these are really good basic saws. It's a good one to start out with. Um, this one I didn't really care for too much. A lot of people love it. Um, it's a, it's about, I think it's about a $25 maybe dollar saw. I'm not sure. Um, I found that there's a little too much wiggle room in it for me, but some people prefer it to any other saw. So I would say give it a try. If you know somebody that has one, you might like this one. It's by Green Lion and you can probably Google Green Lion saw and find it. It sure is a pretty saw though, isn't it? And it has a really comfortable handle. It's not my favorite, um, but then I'm kind of picky. <laughs> this is my absolute favorite saw. This one is by New Concepts. And if you, um, if you buy a saw, you might notice some of them come in a three inch or a five inch. This is a five inch. And the reason I recommend getting a five inch is because um, usually you're you're going to find out if you're sawing a bracelet cuff, which is maybe six inches, and you're sawing along a piece of metal. How about this one? Yeah. So if I'm sawing a straight line, and I'm coming to a point where I need to turn, and I will get to the here, I can't go any further. I will have to turn my blade around or back my blade out, and then come back and go in another way. But if you have um, a longer saw blade you can go farther into the cut so if you're working on bracelet chains or big huge pendants or something it can be beneficial to have a bigger circumference here and all that means is when it says five inch saw or three inch saw this part will either be five inches long or three inches or chain, this is a, a five inch saw I believe there's five inches between the blade and the back so if you're sawing you have five inch clearance and this one is also a five inch um, but they do come in three inch, so you can choose which one works best for you. Obviously, the, the smaller the saw, the more affordable it would be. Um, so your jeweler saw, it, it can be frustrating when you're first learning to use a jeweler saw because it's hard to cut a straight line in metal, and it's kind of not a natural feeling. But once you get the hang of it, um, cutting through metal, metal is a, not as hard as people think it is. And when you just 
you know, be, have kind of a relaxed grip so that when you're using your saw, um, you're not squeezing this really hard and you should be relaxed at the shoulder. So when students come to saw, I always tell them, you know, the first thing I'd like you to do is just relax your shoulders and loosen your grip and hold it maybe even like this or just light so that you're, you're not pulling hard with force. You're just going up and down gently like this. And you're using the whole length of your saw. And you're going up and down. And you're moving from the elbow, not from the wrist. And that's how you should saw. Um, loading the saw blade. When you load a saw blade, there's a ton of videos out there that teach you how to load a saw blade. But um, I don't want to go into a lot of details on all of this stuff because there's already a lot of free material on YouTube. I just want to get you through what the tools are. You, But just remember, it goes like a Christmas tree, blades point down. So if you're holding the saw, the handle's towards you, the blade should point towards you. So if you run your hand up, it will cut, and if you run it down, it will be smooth. This saw I like, it's by New Concepts, K-N-E-W Concepts. It's about a $49 saw, and it has a cam lever. And the cam lever helps me to adjust tension on my blade, because sometimes your blades get loose after a little bit. You see this one's kind of loose here? And if I just pull this to tighten it, it gets tight. And you hear the sound? You should hear that kind of a harp sound when you have the blade at the right tension. Um, the other saws that I have, um, in order to get them to, to go tight, you have to actually hold them like this, and you have to push in and bow the frame, and then screw them tight, and then back up, and then it will be okay. And it's a little bit more cumbersome to change saw blades that way and that's why I like my new concept saw. Um, let's see, the, the, the keys to really successful saw, sawing are having really, really good saw blades. And I have been sawing for a couple of years and I never knew about laser gold blades until on a forum so I asked somebody what kind of blades do you use and they said I use laser gold. And I found out all the people whose work I really liked use laser gold. These were also a good brand. They're called Hercules and a lot of people like those. Um, laser Gold is probably my, probably my favorite though um, because I get a nice sharp cut with those. And I also would recommend you use beeswax to lube your saw. So you'll just take a piece of, of wax, a piece of beeswax, and there's wax in here, and you would take your saw and you would just run it across the blade like this. And your saw would have uh, lubricant on it, which will help it go through. Some people don't use lubricant. Some people do. It's entirely up to you. I prefer it. It makes my job easier when I'm sawing, and uh, it seems to go better. Um, so, um, you know, getting the right the right saw blades. I would recommend for people starting out, and you're sawing on uh, 24 to 22 gauge metal, um, probably a 3 aught blade would be good for you, uh, um, or even maybe... Uh, a 2 aught blade with laser gold I use 2 aught and 3 aught. Um, 3 aught means um, 3 slash 0 or 2 slash 0 because saw blades are, are like this. So if you look at the bottom here you can see it'll tell you the blade number and the gauge that you should use for sawing. Um, Rio Grande has a saw blade chart as well. It's a little, they're all different depending on where you go, people have different opinions on what gauges you should be using. So you have to kind of find out what works best for you. Here's a pack of blades. They're piercing saws and it goes from a two to a one aught. And they're not very expensive. And you can kind of tell they're not very expensive because when you start sawing with them, they don't cut very well. And it makes your, your job very frustrating. So I'd really recommend you try to get some good blades. Um, okay. Uh, I think the next thing we should probably talk about are files. When you are trying to um, finish up your metal, if you've got a nice ring shank or whatever it is that you're trying to work on, you've cut it with the jeweler saw, and now you have to file it. So you're going to want to make sure you have the proper files to do that. Um, a really nice finishing file is um, a flat file, or they also call them bastard files. And a number two is a really great one to have. They aren't cheap. They're anywhere from 20 to 30, maybe even more. I think I paid about $29 for mine. And they don't last forever, so take good care of them. And don't be using it on your, on, you know, on your scrap metal. Just use it. I like to just use mine on silver pieces and uh, things that I know are 
a softer metals because it, it won't ruin my, my files so quickly. Um, you should also have a set, this is like, you can buy a set of files. This is a kind of a standard size. Um, and they come with like all of the basic ones. You, you'll get a round file, a half round file. Um, uh, you'll get uh, uh, various sizes of different types of uh, shapes that you're gonna need to get inside of your work. And I would say buy a file set based on the scale of pieces you think you're gonna be making. A safe bet is something maybe this size. And then people also recommend to get a set of mini files. Mini files come in a little pack. They are about this size. These are tiny ones, little bitty thin ones. You can see that very well. Um, and also they can get in and out of, of corners and, and places where you'll need to be. So, um, and then while we're on the subject of filing, um, I wanted to just also mention that you, you're going to need like sandpaper, which is like a, I would get a 200 grit, the lower the grit, the harder the, 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 uh, the more abrasive it is. Um, an 80 would be the most coarse and a 1500 would probably be the least coarse. So just work your way, work your way in that direction. Um, so also another, I don't know if you've ever seen these, they're sponge sanding blocks and they're great for sanding and filing big pieces of metal, but they're soft. So you're not going to get a flat file. You're just going to get more of a cleaning action. Um, but they're handy to have. My husband likes to use them for his heels for pedicure pads, believe it or not. <laughs> but we get these at Harbor Freight and they're great. They're great for stripping paint off of an uh, old chair or whatever you need them for. Um, another really great thing, they're expensive, but they are so nice for finishing jewelry. They're called 3M Superfine Pads and you can find them on eBay or um, that's usually where I find mine. Um, and you can cut them into smaller pieces and they're actually washable and you can use them for really fine polishing. Um, so if you've got something done and you just really want to clean it up and shine it up and take some little scratches off, it's so fine. It's really great for metal clay as well. If you're working on the greenware stage where the clay is dry and you just want to kind of sand it down before you're going to fire it in the kiln, these are awesome. But I love to use them on, in my jewelry um, for cleaning up bezels. And if, I, if I've done a bezel and I've got a little tube set and I've got some scratches on the outside for my bezel setter, I can just go around like that and clean it and polish it with one of these little pads. Um, so that is super fine pads. You can find on eBay 3M super fine pads. Uh, some other great tools are a, a digital caliper and a, a, just a regular caliper for scoring and marking your metal and, and knowing, um, like scribing into your metal. So if I've got a, sh a piece of sheet and I want to make a ring shank and I know I want my ring shank say 13 millimeters, I can measure out 13 millimeters here and then I can take it. I put my um, one side along the flat edge, the edge that I know is flat, these other edge aren't, aren't flat because they've been cut. And I can scribe a line right along where I want it to go. And then when I go to use the jeweler saw, I, you can't probably can't see that scribe line because scribe line in there. But anyway, it makes like a little line. It's really hard to see. It makes like a little line that you can actually feel too. And then when you take your jeweler saw, you'll know exactly where to cut right along that, that piece. Also, uh, something that's really important that you have in your, in your set would be um, a digital caliper. And a digital caliper you can pick up at Harbor Freight. I got mine on Amazon for around $15. I don't know what brand it is, <laughs> but there, you, you, you just go and look and the ones that have five stars are usually the good ones. Um, they look like this. And you'll use this in jewelry making for a lot of stuff. Um, when you press on, you push it closed to use it, and when you press on, it might not be set. set. So then you just press zero to reset it, kind of like you would a postal scale, and you hold it open, and you can actually tell how thick, you, you know, you use it to, me to measure metal gauges, to measure your stones, um, to measure drill bits and saw blades. You're gonna use it for a lot of stuff. Um, so for example, here, I'm. Put my metal there and it's telling me it's 
So now I know, and it does millimeters or inches, but that's millimeters because normally we work in millimeters. Actually, it's 1.43, I'm sorry. 1.43, and then that's the thickness of my metal. And if I, you can get these little gauges on Rio Grande co under conversion charts, but it will tell you how to convert that number into the gauge metal. So I don't know how thick that piece of metal was that I just measured, but I know it was 1.43. So I can look on my little chart for 1.43 millimeters and the closest one I can find is 1.45, which tells me it's about 15 gauge. And that's kind of how we measure uh, jewelry and metal and, and stones. So it's mostly done in millimeters. Um, and a lot of people will say, well, how thick is your wire? Well, it's 1.4 mils thick. And you're like, what's, what's, what gauge is that? And you can go here and say 1.4, that's 15 gauge wire. So um, it'll help you a lot to have that, that tool. Also, if you're making a ring shank and you need to know the length of your ring, um, and let's say a size eight is, I'm guessing, but 59 millimeters long. So you can actually just put in the length of uh, millimeters you want your ring shank to be. So let's say we're at 59 and I get this up to 59 and then I can set it at 59 and then I can scribe my metal to be that long and I can make a little line there and then when I cut this shank to be a ring it'll be exactly the right size <laughs> in a perfect world <laughs> but I don't live in a perfect world so that's the idea okay what have I forgotten um, we have talked about hammers and files and oh let's talk about some stone setting tools um, not even just limited to stone setting is a tube jig and but it's for holding wire or tube and to make a straight cut um, with your jeweler saw. So if I want to cut a piece of wire you know, in a heavy gauge and I need a really flush cut on the end, I probably wouldn't trust cutters. I'd want to cut it with a saw. And um, this is a five millimeter tube and I use these tubes to make these kinds of rings with the little tube in the stone setting. So there's one that has a garnet, one has a little rhinestone CZ in it. And the sides of those are made out of tubes and they're just soldered onto ring shanks. And when you're cutting a tube, it's really important to get it flat because you're gonna be setting a stone in it and you want that to be perfect. So these are really handy for that. Another tool you can use is a miter jig. I'm not as fond of a miter jig for a tube because it's harder to hold on to when you're sawing. This one has a handle on it and it keeps it straight. And so I can show you, scribe on, on the camera. So I just marked it with a Sharpie, you can see there. So I'm gonna, that's gonna be the line I'm gonna wanna cut it on. So I'll put it inside of my tube jig and I'll put that black line where I want the saw blade to go and then I will pull down my lever so that I can see that I'm sawing right on that line. Now this is the line that I want to cut on and you see this line, this is where your saw blade goes. So when I cut it, I will hold it like this and I will put it, rest it right here and this is another good thing your bench pin is for, is helping you hold tools. It, it slips right in this V slot and it gives me a nice sturdy handle. And I can take, I can lube up my saw with my beeswax and I would run it through here and then I would start cutting. And I would make a nice little cut. And I would just go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. But I would get a really nice straight cut and the little piece would fall off and I'd have a perfect tube setting. And from there I could make a ring um, setting. So that's what the tube jig is for. They're wonderful. And also just for wire, if you just got a piece of wire you want to stick in there and get a nice flush cut. Let's say you're making a 10 gauge uh, ring or a 10 gauge um, bracelet or you just you need some thick wires you're making some big links this is a great way to cut them for jump rings um, okay so uh, let's talk a little bit more about this tool this is called a miter jig and it's great for getting a really straight cut um, it's kind of like a mini vise I, if I'm traveling it's great if I'm not traveling I just use my vise um, but the way you use this is you take a piece of metal and you would Stick it inside 
there's actually a little catch. You see this little uh, notch that's here? That's where your metal would rest up against. You First of all, let me show you it's together and then you would pull it apart wherever you wanted to stick your pieces in. And it has different slots for different type things. This slot is to make a 45 degree angle and I think that's what this is the most helpful for. So if I need to make an angle cut on this piece of metal, I could put it in like this. So I could use a file and go, I'd screw these down and you see the angle I'm trying to get? So if I'm trying to join two pieces of metal, I'm like make a box and I need this to be like at the right angle. I would take one of my big files. So I won't file the whole thing, but that's how, that's how you can get a nice flush cut. Or you can use it for a straight cut. You can also put a tube in there. Mostly what I use is a, lot, a real vise cut um, and I can file right on top of this surface and uh, it doesn't, I don't care because it's just an old nasty file, uh, vise and it works great. I also have a fancier one. And this one is a Harbor Freight, and um, I like it because it, it rotates. So if I'm working on something and I want to have a flat edge, I've got one. I can turn this little dial back here and I can flip it around. And on the top, I've got a place for tubes and I've got a place for a square. If I've got a, like a square wire or a square piece of metal that I need to hold, or it's got a little tiny one and a bigger one. I don't know if you can see the little tiny one in there. There you go. So it's got a little tiny hole and a wider one. And um, so, yeah, so it's, and, and then you can tighten it down and make it do. You can also uh, spin it this way if you're just left handed or right handed and you want to, you know, get a different angle when you're filing and you want to file the other side, you can do like that. So, and it also has a, um, a hammering part here, a little steel bench that if you need to tap or hammer, you can do so right there. So I know in part one we talked a little bit about the flex shaft, um, but I just wanted to let you know that if you are going to be making rings and setting stones, you're really going to want to have a flex shaft, um, not only just for drilling straight, but for setting stones and burrs. You can do a lot of it with a Dremel, um, um, but these little drill burrs, and, uh, and you probably can't see that very well, <laughs> there's a teeny tiny little ball burr on the end of that, and that is uh, what would be used to make a flush setting. So, for example, this is a flesh setting, and this is an earring that has um, uh, little pieces of silver um, on here. This is a tube setting, and these are flesh set, these little other ones. And so it's a piece of silver or metal, and you would burr a hole into it, with, first with a drill, and then with a ball burr, or a flame burr, or a heart burr, depending on what kind of burr you prefer to use. And then you would use a setting burr and you would drop your stone inside. And um, these are really, really good for that. Um, also, just to let you know that the, the possibilities with a rotary tool for cleaning your, your metal and texturing your metal, I mean, I talked a little bit about these um, gritty, they're like sandpaper. And also, this is like a big brass brush that you can use to just scrub up your metal in places you couldn't get with a big brush. You can also use little burrs to engrave in your metal. Um, to polish your metal, it's a polishing one that's done with some um, Renaissance wax. And then they have these like little silicone burrs that you can use to get into really tiny spaces and take scratches out and flatten little parts. So uh, if you're also going to be drilling stone on stone or drilling in beach glass, this is a great tool for that um, because um, you can get diamond end burrs. There's, here's one that has a diamond burr on the, on the tip and that can go through glass or, or stone. Um, so again, great, great, great to have a flex shaft if you can afford it. This is a bezel rocker, and the bezel rocker is meant for setting stones um, into, a, into a setting. So here I have a ring that has a bezel around it, and when I put the bezel on it, it will be flat and sticking up straight, and then I'll need to actually rock this bezel around the stone to secure it in place. Um, there's also a burnisher. Once it's down, it will need to be burnished and you would need to actually just take like a burnisher and slide the burnisher along the sides of that bezel to work out any little kinks in there and to make it nice and smooth and it will also make it shiny. So metal on metal, remember we talked about earlier, steel um, on metal, metal on metal will burnish it just like in your tumbler and make it shiny and make it look pretty. So you can use it to polish metal on metal. And that's what the burnisher is for. 
Um, there are different sizes of burnishers. There are probably the most standard one is this size, and this is usually the size that people buy. There are three to five dollars. I don't think they're expensive. And they also, in Rio, I think you can buy a pack of different sizes. So it might have like a bezel pusher and two sizes of bezels, um, burnishers. This is a mini burnisher, and this is the one that I use for flush setting. Um, because when I'm trying to get into a flush set stone, I want to go around the stone to seat it because I have to move the metal in a circle to actually. So I'm going to want to go like around and around and around my stone after I've drilled it with the burr. And that's what would push the metal down inside. And the way that this is shaped and t is exact, it's really sharp on the end. And it's perfect for that because it keeps your um, tip straight up and down because you hold it like this and just to go around. Um, they also make one that's like this. It's a little harder to hold, but it does the same thing. Most people end up making their own tool because these are, the handle's way too long. <laughs> I mean, if it had a handle down here, that would be easier to hold, but this is, could also be used as an awl and for scratching and scribing too. So, one tool I didn't show you yet for, um, for setting rings, is it's called bezel setting set. This, these are only, they only uh, are meant to work with the tube set. So if you're doing tube set rings, and we talked about this is kind of a tube setting. So um, it has a, a, a tube soldered on and it has a stone inside. So what you would do is you would take the tube and you would solder it on your ring shank. And then you would burr the center out with the drill burr that I showed you on your flex shaft. And then you would put the stone in. And then instead of a, using a bezel pusher, now I always usually end up using bezel pushers. And I would rock that edge over. So we talked about how you would rock the edge over the stone. Um, instead of doing that, you can get a different look. So this one was done with a bezel pusher. I don't know if you can see that very well. I'm going to get you a little closer there. If you can see that edge. But you see more of the face of the stone. Um, if you use a bezel punch set, the way this works is you find the size, the right millimeter, usually a little bit bigger than what your setting is. And so if you're using a five millimeter, if it's five millimeters inside, it's probably 5.5 on the outside, but you can just tell by looking at them. You put it in this little chuck, you turn it, and then you put it upside down over your stone. And then it, using your ring shank holder that we had earlier, to hold the ring, you would then take your chasing hammer and whack the top of it to set it. And it would cover the metal over the stone. So that's another way you can do it. But it gives you a different look and you should probably be aware of that. I would say don't start out with one of these, but if you're going to be mass producing bezel set tube, or tube set rings, then yes, you might want to get one. Um, the way it looks is like this. You see here where it looks like this is done with, a, with that punch, where it looks like um, there's more metal covering the stone. Hopefully you can see that okay. Versus this one, if you can see it, it has more metal. There's less of the stone showing and more metal folded over. This one is just the opposite. It has more stone showing. So it just depends on the look you want to get. But you can use those punches as well. Um, it also matters how deep you drill your seating so if you sometimes if you go and you drill a seating too deep um, and your stones kind of lost inside you use one of those bezel punchers and punch over it and it'll kind of cover this in but you, you won't get to see as much of the stone because you'll have all that extra and you know jewelry making is not an inexpensive hobby i think you're probably finding that out right now with part two uh, of this video. All right, if you've done any kind of, uh, bought any books, um, enameling or any of them, they almost every, even wire making, will start out with showing you a dapping block. Mine's dirty, by the way. Um, but a dapping block is used for a variety of things. Um, I use dapping blocks. You should definitely have a set if you're going to be a jeweler because, um, I use them any, I use them for making spinner rings. I couldn't make a spinner ring without my dapping block. Um, it helps you make, um, a metal, into a concave shape. Um, another tool that you would probably want to use with it is a disc cutter. Although you can buy um, you can buy metal already cut in circles and things that you don't have to have a disc cutter. But I have a disc cutter, and mine looks like this. 
and so you actually put the metal in here and then you screw this you push this down and you screw it down until it gets tight and then you would take your appropriate size um, peg you want to make sure you're not hammering on the flat edge you see or I should say the sharp edge um, a lot of people hammer on the wrong side there should be like a, a, a serrated edge or sometimes they're colored you might even want to just take your uh, set and write and, and, and put a T for top so you know that you're not supposed to hammer on that when you get them because that's a good way to mess up your set. Anyway, you stick them inside and then you hit them with like this brass mallet would be perfect for this job. You hit it really hard. You try to only strike it once, but chances are you're going to have to hit it a couple times to get it to make a circle for you. And once you get your little circle disc, you can take that disc and put it into your dapping block and you can make a, a, a cup, a cup shape. So you would take a circle and a metal and put it in here and then put your, you would start with, you want to make it more shallow and smaller and then work it into the deeper groove. So you start out bigger and you work, you work your way smaller. Um, this one is really deep and it would actually make something like this. This is a piece that I've enameled, it's a piece of copper and it's made a little cup. So that's kind of the thing you can do with it. You can even use tiny little flowers and make them into cups too. Whatever you find that you want to work on. Um, these are great. Also, um, I take these and I put them in my vise and I use them as like stakes. So I can hammer if I, if I need like a ball jack or whatever. You can, these, you can actually buy jumbo ones and they're, they're, they're awesome. So they come in different sizes, but you can, if I wanted to lay metal over it and hammer on it and kind of get uh, an, a synclastic shape, or I, I could do that. Synclastic means like this, and anticlastic means like this. <laughs> so that is the dapping block. Brand new ben bench shear. Um, it has a big handle on the top, and this is a six inch shear. And I'll show you how this works. So I just take my piece of metal that I want to cut and I put it inside and I, I would probably scribe it and mark a line on where I want to cut it. This is a 20 gauge sheet. I'd line that line up and as easy as butter it cuts through a 20 gauge sheet and gives me a nice ring shank. So and I do a lot of rings and 20 gauge is a big one that I use. So. That's why I like having this. I don't have to do a whole lot of filing and cutting, but with this, you kind of get a really nice straight cut. So that's a nice tool. That tool is made by Grizzly, and it is about $69, and it's grizzly.com. There's also a guy named Kevin Potter who sells these. What he does is he takes a, the Grizzly ones, and then he adds this really beautiful table, so it becomes more like a guillotine shear, and it has like measurements on it, so you can really get a perfect cut with your metal by using it that way. Kevin Potter is uh, PotterUSA.com if you want to look at his shears. And he's also got some cool pancake dies and hydraulic presses and all sorts of other neat stuff. This is my rolling mill. Um, there's a gal on uh, YouTube who, her name is Melissa Muir, and she has a, a YouTube channel called Tool Time Wednesday, or Tuesday, Tool Time Tuesday. And she has a great uh, video demo on how to use a rolling mill. And I would definitely, she's, she's got some great tutorials. And you, so, um, but the rolling mills can be used, your metal feeds through here, and you can open and close your mill by turning this dial. And if you get a mill, you want to get one that has this um, reduction gear on the side because it's going to make it much easier to crank through. So it has like a little extra gear that helps you crank your sheet through ingot of metal or a thick piece of metal and put it through your mill and make it into a sheet you can do that you can use it for flattening wire you can use it when you're making um, inlay um, or when you're doing mocha may I think you've seen some of my mocha may pieces I know I've posted them out but that's an inlay of metals and you're compressing metal on top of metal with and solder in between um, and I use it for that. And also what's really great is you can make, you can buy these flat or you can buy them with um, grooves in them. And if you have grooves in them, you can turn round wire into square wire. You can also, um, a little trick that some of you might be interested in is you could take a charcoal block on your 
uh, soldering table and you can cut out a deep groove in it. You can melt your scrap silver and let it melt into that deep groove like a tube shape and then let it cool and then clean it off really good, pickle it, clean it all off. And then you can, if it's not too thick, you can start putting it through your mill and make your own silver sheet or you can make your own ring shanks. So these are really neat to have. What people really mostly buy them for and they think they're gonna do a lot of, but that they don't usually do a ton on is texturing metal. Um, you can take something, one of my favorite things to do is to take a piece of lamp, lamp banding and, um, and put it with a piece of silver and wrap them in cardstock and feed them through my mill and I get a lovely impression. Um, that's how this ring was done. Um, and then I stamped a stamp on top of the impression, but this was all done with the rolling mill and lamp banding. You can see all the detail in there. So yeah, so you can do a lot of fun stuff with a rolling mill and they're great. They're not the first piece of equipment you'd buy just because they're expensive, but oh, it's heavy. I'm gonna show this to you. It looks like this, and this little disc at the bottom is for making um, synclastic shapes on a ring. Get that off of there. So if I put a ring on top and I want to stretch it, I just put the ring over here like this, and then I would pull this arm and it would stretch it out. And it would make this wider so that my ring would stretch. With and you have to be careful. You want to anneal it, or you just want to make sure you go really slow, because it can, you know, obviously snap the seam too. And if I wanted to make a ring smaller, what I would do is I would put it in one of these little discs down here. This is not really a good ring to do that with, but I would put it in one of these little discs, and then I would spin it, and I would pull this down, this handle and it would compress the ring and make it into a synclastic shape. So um, like it would, the ring right now is like this and then it would make it kind of the top and bottom curl so it would be like a C shape and the, or a comfort band, I believe they call that, that shape. Okay, now I seriously think I've shown you all my cool tools. <laughs> um, before I leave you though, I'd just like to mention a couple of great books. Um, I like books and I think that you can learn a lot from them. Not everything, because if you're like me, you're a visual learner, but for reference, if you've seen a tutorial or, or somebody's done something a certain way and you might want to know what tools other people would use to do it, that's where a book can come in handy. Um, this book is great. Um, it's called The Workbench Guide to Jewelry Techniques. And um, this gal who wrote this book is Anastasia Young. And she's got a lot of cool things in here, and she tells you how to do them. She doesn't give you really detailed instructions. Absolutely the thinnest basic instruction you've ever want, wouldn't want to know. Like, she doesn't give you too much information, but she gives you just a little bit. But it's great for inspiration and a lot of ideas. She does have a great section explaining hammers and tools and how to use them and when you would use them. And sometimes just looking through these books, you can find tools that nobody told you about. You think, gosh, that might be neat to try that. Um, uh, let's see, I'm just going to give you an example of one of the things that she has in here. Um, like how to bend a, a wire into a ring, um, fusing silver, you know, um, and then she actually has some projects in the back. She shows you how to use a graver, just things that you probably wouldn't see in a general tutorial, um, but some great techniques and great information just on tools in this book. Also. One, it's become like my go-to book. I just love this book. It's called um, Silversmithing Jewelry Makers. And it's, 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 it's just silver. So everything in here is they're silver pieces. It's great for inspiration. It does have some techniques. Um, chasing in repoussé. There's a whole section on how to do it in here. Um, there's also engraving again, etching. There are some great ideas and things you can do with stamps. There's this one page that shows she shows you casting if you're in, in, interested in doing any casting and there's one one page on texturing that's really really good and it shows you a lot of uh, great things you can do and different ways to texture your metal this one i think is really cool where she did all of this work with just metal stamps and i get ideas from these books all the time so um you can have a lot of fun if you can get yourself connected with resources and, and places where you can learn from um gosh okay one last tool i guess i'll sneak it in 
I use this tool all the time. It's kind of my teacher tool. It's a mini grinder. Um, I went to Harbor Freight and I bought it. It's a two inch mini grinder. They were $19. And I took the sides off and replaced these two grinders. This one has like an 80 coarse grinder on it now. So if I've got a really rough piece of metal and it's just maybe a piece of copper or brass, I wouldn't really use silver on this because it's silver's just too soft and too delicate. But I could grind a corner off or I could make I could grind out a circle if I wanted to. Um, when I'm doing mokame, um, I use it all the time to get sharp flat edges. I grind all those this stuff off of it, uh, the sides so that they're flat. Um, it's kind of like a belt sander, but it's a grinder on this side. And this side has this kind of coarse, almost like a steel wool tool. And it's similar to the one that I showed you that was on my flex shaft, like this. And it's great for, um, for just cleaning metal and polishing metal and taking uh, fire scale off or, or you know, cleaning up your steel block if it gets dirty or cleaning your jewelry tools. Um, I do have a kiln because I use metal clay and I do enameling. So I torch fire enamels, which is my preferred method, but sometimes I like to, to kiln fire things. And this is my kiln right now. It's not being used. It's all covered up with stuff. You see, there's my little Paragon kiln. Um, if you're going to buy a kiln to use metal clay, you absolutely need a digital timer on it because um, you, you need to fire in different stages and you need to fire for a certain amount of time and sometimes you have to change the temperature. So um, that is a great, great kiln for that. Okay, so that's it um, for part two. Uh, I don't have any other tools right now to show you that I can think of. But if you have any questions, please feel free to look for me online and or leave a message here on the YouTube video and I will be more than happy to answer them for you. And if you need any resources for places where I got any of my tools, I'll put a link at the bottom and, let, and add it as you ask me and you want to know where, where to get things. Okay, I hope you enjoyed it. So I hope you have a great day and tune back in. Subscribe me. Subscribe. <laughs>